All right, we are going to uh, celebrate Purim this morning. We're going to observe the main ritual, which is the reading of the Megillah, the book of Esther. Uh, the holiday itself was on Wednesday night, uh, but uh, and Thursday, but uh, we're going to uh, we're going to time travel back just a few days, reset, and we'll have our Purim reading. Um, when we do Purim, we make noise. We obliterate the name of Haman. We, yes, some, yeah, okay, not yet. Uh, wait, wait for the reading of the Megillah. We cheer for the hero of the story, Mordechai. Uh, if you, in the 21st century, if you want to, you can ooh or ah for Queen Esther. Um, in other words, this is a participatory event. And uh, our friend Joel is going to help because the Megillah is long. Even so, I'm cutting large portions of it and summarizing large portions of it, but Joel and I are going to read it uh, tag team and uh, get through together. And uh, But first, before we... Before we get into the noisy part of the festival, why do Purim? Why, aside from the fact that, I mean, it's not on Torah, right? So why do Purim? It is a Jewish tradition. It can be found in the, in the, in the Hebrew Bible, in Esther. Uh, but Purim provides a fascinating glimpse into the historical origins of a religious festival. And that festival's been faithfully several, celebrated worldwide for 2,500 years. What is at stake at Purim is nothing less than the continuance of the chosen people's existence. It's not small stakes. And the holiday commemorates God's activity in preserving the Jewish people through working behind the scenes to orchestrate a symphony and weave a tapestry of redemption for the Jewish people. We don't celebrate Purim because uh, the rabbis wanted to fill in a large gap in the Jewish calendar between uh, Sukkot and uh, Tabernacles and, and, and Passover. They said, well, between October and, uh, and the spring, we got nothing going on. We need to stick something in. That's not why it's there. Uh, it's there because, as Esther 9 tells us, verse 28, these days were to be remembered and celebrated throughout every generation, every family, every province, every city. And these days of Purim were not to fail from among the Jews or their memory fade from their descendants. So that is why we observe Purim. So we're going to talk about Purim's, Purim customs and obligations a little later on, but uh, the most important one, the most popular one, is what's called the Megillah reading, which is to read through the entire book of Esther every year, once a year. And as is, we're doing a modified version right now of the Megillah reading. And uh, some of you may have received your grogers. I think they've been passed out. Uh, and the idea is to, now hold, keep your powder dry, people. Um, we're going to, when we hear the name of he who shall not be named right now, because I know there's wise guys here, okay? Uh, when we hear that particular uh, name, uh, we are going to, uh, you can stomp your feet, you can boo, and you can go with your grog. Or, or, that wasn't my stomach. That was the, the, my, my imitation of the grogger sound, okay? Uh, so uh, <laughs> it is the idea to eradicate his name from the earth. We'll see a little bit why. Uh, we do that in a little bit within the text itself. I'll point out uh, the origin of who Haman is, his ethnicity, and where he comes from. So, uh, to summarize chapter one, uh, there is a king, uh, King uh, Ahasuerus, or Hazuerus, uh, if you will, in the uh, book of Esther, who is mentioned. Uh, it's King Xerxes historically. And uh, he throws a party. He orders that his queen, Queen Vashti, come and parade herself in front of all his guests. He wants to show her off, talk about the original trophy wife. Uh, and she proclaims a day without a woman uh, and uh, tells him to, uh, to go fly a kite. And he 
tells her, how about we replace you? Uh, and uh, so we're looking now for a replacement for Queen Vashti, and we get into the end of chapter one. There's a beauty contest throughout all the population of, uh, of Persia, and, uh, uh, and we meet a young Jewish maiden. Her name is Esther, or Hadassah in uh, Hebrew, and she's entered into the contest, and wouldn't you know, she is, spoiler, she's going to win. So we pick up the narrative here. Joel, would you like to read at this point? him more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his princes and his servants. He also made a holiday for the provinces and gave gifts according to the king's bounty. When the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai Woo! was sitting at the king's gate. That was so pathetic. Would you mind reading verse 19 again there, Joel? When the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai hey! was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not yet made, her known, made known her kindred or her people, even as Mordecai hey! had commanded her. For Esther did what Mordecai hey! told her as she had done when under his care. After these events, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, Boom! the son of Hamadatta, the Agagite, and advanced him and established his authority over all the princes who were with him. Okay, now, let me come in, tag out. <laughs> we, thank you. Yeah. You know, uh, the reason stomp our feet is actually uh, not because we need a little uh, aerobic exercise, although some of us do more than others. Uh, but uh, uh, a lot of the kids, we write Haman's name on their shoes, and so by, by rubbing and uh, uh, stomping, you eradicate the writing of that, he who shall not be named. Uh, but uh, here's the identification of this individual uh, I'm careful because of you guys. Um, uh, of this individual as uh, descending from Amalek uh, for the careful reader of Scripture <coughs> is very important. You'll remember Deuteronomy 25, verses 17, following. Remember what Amalek, Moses said, remember what Amalek, the nation, did to you along the way when he came out of Egypt. When you came out of Egypt, how he met you along the way and attacked you. Uh, among you, all the stragglers at your rear. You know how you see on Mutual of Omaha, Wild Kingdom, or on the Discovery, that dates me, uh, or uh, on the Discovery Channel, or the, the planet Earth, or whatever. You see uh, always the predators are taking the, the, the weak and attacking from the rear and grabbing the easy pickings. That's what Amalek did with Israel. Attacked among you all the stragglers at your rear when you were faint and weary, and he did not fear God. Therefore it shall come about when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your surrounding enemies. In the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You must not forget. Except, of course, King Saul forgot. Um, uh, <laughs> he wasn't taking his ginkgo bobloba or whatever, uh, and uh, he did not uh, uh, kill the king. He kept some people, and that cost him a, a kingdom. But yeah, there's still some who are out there. Haman is a descendant from this nation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as you go to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. Uh, Haman is an Agagite, right? And utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, okay? Which made God agag uh, with anger. Uh, and uh, that was the end of Saul's dynasty. So we now pick up the story here. All the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, 
Why are you transgressing the king's command? Now it was when they had spoken daily to him, and he would not listen to them, that they told Amen to see whether Mordecai's reason would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. Now, pay attention to this. Was was there no Jew in the course of Jewish history who ever uh, paid respects to the governmental officials? You think this through. Like, this is, this is your reason, right? This is the reason that Mordecai, I, I'm a Jew, I don't bow down, right? But I can think of other instances when Jews did bow down and pay the proper protocols. So what's happening here is interesting, food for thought. Now, when Haman saw that Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage to him, Haman was filled with rage, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him who the people of Mordecai were. Therefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. In the, fourth, in the first month, which is the month Nisan, that's the month, not the car, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, Pur, uh, as my cat told me this morning, Pur, which is the lot, was cast before... I'm sorry, what? No, 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 no. That name wasn't recited yet. Are you, you're making noise in vain. You're just a bunch of noisy rabble-rousers, okay? Um, here we go. Haman, from day to day and from month to month until the twelfth month, that is the month Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among your peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of all other people, and they do not observe the king's laws. So it's not in the king's interest to let them remain. If it's pleasing to the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who carry on the king's business to put into the king's treasures. And the king took a signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of the... Amatath, the Agagai, the enemy of the Jews, the king said to Haman, the silver is yours, the people also to do with them as you please. Tag. Oops. I'll take this with me. Yeah. When Mordecai learned all that he had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth on ashes, and went out into the midst of the city and wailed loudly and bitterly. He went as far as the king's gate, for no one was to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. In each and every province where the command and decree of the king came, there was great mourning. Among the Jews with fasting, weeping and wailing, and many lay on sackcloth and ashes. Then Esther's maidens and her eunuchs came and told her, and the queen writhed in great anguish. And she sent gardens, garments to clothe Mordecai, oh! that he might remove his sackcloth from him. But he did not accept them. Then, some, then Esther summoned Hatach from the king's eunuchs, whom the king had appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to, learn, to learn what this was and why it was. So Hatach went to Mordecai. Hey! to the city square in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact amount of money that Haman <laughs> had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict which had been issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show Esther and inform her and to order her to go into the king, king to implore his favor and to plead with him for her people. Hatak came back and related Mordecai hey. words to Esther. Then Esther spoke to Hatak and ordered him to reply to Mordecai. Woo! All of the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that for any man or woman who comes to the king, to the inner court, who is not summoned, he has but one law that he be put to death. Unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter so, so that he may live, and I have not been summoned to come to the king for these 30 days. 
They related Esther's words to Mordecai. Hey! Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther. Do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. All right. Let me tag in. Thank you, sir. Everybody gets very excited about this verse. And the portion of the verse that they get excited about, uh, whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this, is, I think, not truly the most exciting and dynamic portion of this verse. So it's nice. Makes a good title of a book. I rather point to if you remain silent now, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. You, your father's house, will pay, you'll die. Local, the local Jewish population will die. But relief and deliverance for the Jewish people as a whole will arise for another, from another place. For a book that doesn't mention God one time, there certainly seems to be faith in something, I believe someone, that Mordechai is expressing here. What does he mean? How can he be so confident that relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place? Because of the Abrahamic covenant. So we'll take a little diversion from the Megillah for a moment and just give you a little background as to that verse, what Mordechai is talking about. Remember the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12, 3, I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. There is a promise that if people come against you, if people bless you, It'll be good for them. If people come against you, it's going to go very badly for them. And you take the Abrahamic covenant and you put it together with the promise of the new covenant that Jeremiah had delivered. That's not exactly hot off the press, but it was recent at that time, a century, a century and a half ago. Uh, Verse 35 says, thus says the Lord. This is not the new covenant portion that Hebrews uh, uh, quotes uh, regarding the new heart and the spirit within you. And, uh, this is the part that people ignore, but shouldn't be ignored. Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night. Who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts, the Lord of cosmic armies is his name. It's not a way of saying God's a great party giver. Or the Lord of hosts, uh, he's the host with the most. Um, it's the cosmic armies. If this fixed order, what fixed order? He just talked about the sun, the moon, the stars, the waves. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord. Then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. So, God gives us the recipe in Jeremiah 31. How to destroy the people of Israel once and for all. To destroy the people of Israel requires destroying the sun, the moon, the stars, the fixed order of the cosmos itself. In other words, not going to happen. It is not within the human potential to do so. Therefore, the Jewish people will, as a corporate entity, will remain secure. Now, pockets may die. Large portions of them may be slaughtered up to, shall we say, a third. Could very easily. And in the future, as we talked about my Bible study, two-thirds 
will be killed during the time of Jacob's travel. But nonetheless, you cannot eradicate Israel from the face of the earth as long as there is a sun in the sky, a moon, a night, stars, and a God in his heavens. That's why Mordechai could say, the Jewish people will be, or we locally may not be okay, but the Jewish people will survive. Well, the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out from below. Then I also will cast off the offspring of Israel from all, for all that they have done, declares the Lord. Until that time, it's foolhardy and futile to destroy the, destroy the Jewish people. It will not succeed, and history is filled with those who have tried and who have perhaps made some progress, but ultimately failed. That's why we're still here. The Persians, long gone. The uh, Malachites, they are long gone. The Edomites are gone. The Moabites are gone. The Hittites are gone. The Israelites, we're still here. Back to our regularly scheduled programming. If you remain silent at this time, relief or deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. Not to minimize that verse, you're placed, all of us are placed in spheres of influence and positions of influence. And it's always such a time as it. right now is a time. Tomorrow will be a time. And the next day, and the next day, until our Lord comes, we'll continue to live in moments that are times like this, when the influence of one person within their sphere can make all the difference. If you speak, if you are not silent. The Nestor told them the reply to Mordechai, Sleeping, I put you to sleep. Go, assemble all the Jews who were found in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. You are the one. I and my maidens also will fast in the same way and thus I will go into the king, which is not according to the law because you remember, right? Uh, he hasn't sent for me in 30 days. If I go in without being summoned, uh, death is the order of the day. If I don't die from three days of fasting uh, uh, and <laughs> I wind up going into the, the see the king, I will probably die. And if I perish, I perish, but I've got to try. That to me is courage. If I perish, I perish. So many of you of us, so many of you watching at home, if faced with, it's hard to imagine analogous circumstances, right? But nonetheless, we all have opportunities to put ourselves on the line, right? If I perish, uh, well, is my life insurance paid up? What will happen about this? And, and well, I didn't finish this project, and uh, it's not time for me to, I don't have time for perishing right now. Don't you understand the pressure I'm under? Uh, it's very difficult. So, more, so, yeah, okay. Went away and did just as Esther had commanded him. And when the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court, she obtained favor in his sight. And the king extended to Esther the golden scepter, which was in his hand. Tag. Esther said, if it please the king, may the king and Haman oh! come this day to the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then Haman oh! went out that day glad and pleased of heart. And when Haman oh! saw, saw Mordecai hey! in, in the king's gate, and that he did not stand up or tremble before him, Haman oh! was filled with anger against Mordecai. Woo! Haman con oh! controlled himself, however, went to his house and sent for his friends and his wife, Zeresh. Then Haman... Oh! 
recounted to them the glory of his riches and a number of his sons and every instance where the king had magnified him and how he had promoted him above the princes and servants of the king. Haman also said, even Esther the queen, let no one but me come with the king to the banquet which she had prepared. And tomorrow also I am invited by her with the king. Yet all of this does not satisfy me every time I see Mordecai. Sorry. <laughs> Mordecai, the Jew, sitting at the king's gate. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> then Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends said to him, Have a gallows, fifty cubits high, made, and in the morning he asked the king to have Mordecai. Yay! Hanged on it, then go joyfully with the king to the banquet. Why are they cheering for Mordecai getting hanged? Wait, what's wrong with you people? You're sick, sick. All right, go. So the, so the king said, <laughs> who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace in order to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai Woo! on the gallows which there he we go again. <laughs> <laughs> on the gallows which he had prepared for him. The king said, who is in oh, the sorry. court? Yeah. My bad. The king's servants said to him, behold, Haman is standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in and the king said to him, what is to be done for the man whom the king desires to honor? And Haman said to himself, whom would the king desire to honor more than me? Then the king said to Haman, Take quickly the robes and the horses, as you have said, and do so for Mordecai, Woo! the Jew who is sitting at the king's gate. Do not fall short in anything at all of, of all that you have said. All right, tag. So Haman took the robe of the horse and arrayed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city square and proclaimed before him, thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honor. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate but Haman hurried home, mourning with his head covered. Haman recounted to Zeresh's wife and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and Zeresh's wife said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish origin, you shall not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. What does Zeresh know? the Abrahamic covenant. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. Always listen to your wife. That's one of the great lessons of the book of Esther that no one ever talks about. If only Haman had listened to Zeresh's wife, Mrs. Mrs. Haman, boo, uh, then uh, it might have had a different ending. But let's keep going. Now the king and Haman came to drink wine with Esther, ah, the queen. And the king said to Esther on the second day, also as they drank their wine at the banquet, what is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request, even to the half of the kingdom? It shall be done. And Queen Esther replied, if I found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me as my petition, and my people as my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Destroyed, killed, annihilated. You get the point, right? Now, if we had only been sold as slaves, men and women, I would have remained silent. If he had only enslaved us, I, would, I wouldn't say a word. Quiet as a mouse, not a peep. For the trouble would not be commensurate with the annoyance to the king. But we're not being enslaved. We're being killed, destroyed, and annihilated. That's worth speaking up for. Then King Ahasuerus asked King Esther, Queen Esther, who is he and where is he who would presume to do thus? Esther said, J'accuse, a foe and an enemy is this wicked Haman. And Haman became terrified before the king and queen. 
The king arose in his anger from drinking wine and went into the palace garden, but Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for she saw that harm had been determined against him by the king. Now when the king returned from the palace garden into the place where they were drinking wine, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther... Now, picture this, okay? You've got to picture this, right? The king steps out, leaving Esther and her foe alone in the room. Esther's reclining, as royalty would, on the couch. Haman gets up, approaches the couch, and falls upon the couch to beg for his life. The king walks in, and you can only imagine his surprise when he sees Haman drooped over his wife, Esther. Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. The king said, will he even assault the queen with me in the house? What chutzpah, which is an old Persian word, meaning chutzpah, as the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. It's a loss of face. Right there. That harbored not one of the eunuchs who went before the king said, Behold, indeed, the gallows standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, which spoke good on behalf of the king. And the king said, Hang him on it. Well, that's what happens. The uh, enemy of the Jews, his family, his sons, are hung on the gallows that were designed to execute Mordechai and the Jewish people. The world turned upside down. The story has a twist that's worthy of Rod Serling or O. Henry, where up is down and down is up. But we still got a problem because the law of the Medes and the Persians cannot be changed, and the king made a law that the Jews are to be executed. The Jews who were in Susa assembled on the 13th and 14th of the same month. They rested on the 15th day and made it a day of feasting and rejoicing. Uh, therefore, the Jews of the rural areas who lived in their rural towns made the 14th day of the month Adar, a holiday for rejoicing and feasting and sending portions of food to one another. The king, what the king allowed them to do was to defend themselves. When uh, people came, when the army came to, uh, to destroy them, the Jewish people were allowed to take up arms and in a Civil, it's not an insurrection, it's, uh, they're defending their lives, and uh, not only their way of lives, but their very lives themselves. And they win. They were able to defeat, push back the villains of the peace, the armies, or just, just following orders. Uh, they were able to push that back, and they make it a holiday uh, of rejoicing. It's a joyful festival. It's joyful because you get to feast, eating and drinking and making merry. And not only that, but sending portions of food to one another. Uh, it's the time to remember your, 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 your brothers, your sisters, your uh, extended mishbucha. So because it says portions, you know, the rabbis are such sticklers, right? It's the, you can't just send one portion. You have to send at least two. So multiple portions of food, plural portions of food to one another. It's a very common place that somebody will send over a basket of cookies or a nice uh, a platter of something, whatever, to your neighbors and uh, enjoy uh, one another. Well... Here's how the holiday gets established. The Mordecai recorded these events. They sent letters to all the Jews who were the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, obliging them to celebrate the 14th day of the month of Dar and the 15th day of the same month annual. Who is this pipsqueak who uh, will not bow down and now has the chutzpah, has the gall to uh, write letters to all the Jewish uh, people uh, throughout Persia to uh, make sure you celebrate this holiday? Uh, how did he get so much power? Who... Who, who died and left Mordecai the boss of Israel? Well, it's just, this is the way it worked. Uh, it caught on. Uh, so the Jewish people adopted another holiday because on those days, the Jews rid themselves of their enemies. It was a month which turned out for them from sorrow into gladness, from mourning into a holiday. And that they should make them days of feasting and rejoicing, sending portions of food to one another and gifts to the poor. There it is. 
So we talked about the Purim customs obligations, the Megillah, the Megillah reading, the reading of the, of, the, of, the, of the story, and there's more, and we cut a good portion of it out for time, but you get the gist of it. Um, many, uh, um, uh, many Jewish people have uh, Purim plays, we call Purim spiels, uh, and uh, they're uh, uh, generally comedic in nature, uh, dressing up in costumes. We saw some of our people are wearing, co at least I'm assuming that what I see is some of our people wearing costumes uh, to <laughs> They either that or they're a little eccentric. Uh, it's okay. Uh, and the idea of eat, drink, and be merry, that's the theme of this holiday. And uh, uh, the upside downness of the, of the holiday, what you expect to happen, it's the opposite. And the good guys look like they're going to lose, and they wind up winning. The bad guys are punished, receiving uh, the just rewards, or just desserts, rather. Um, there's uh, also a Torah reading, of course, and sending the portions we talked about, gifts to the poor. This is one of those holidays where you think about other people. And uh, eating humantash and the, uh, the famous uh, three-cornered pastry. Uh, Joel, Joel, did you have any humantash this week? Did you get a chance to eat any humantash? No, I, I missed Tobintashin this week completely. A lot of stuff going on this week, and uh, uh, not, I didn't even have time to, uh, to grab some subpar humantashin from uh, uh, one of our local establishments. Uh, did anybody get uh, to eat some humantashin this week? Okay. Because uh, between you and me, not missing anything. Uh, but uh, these are the traditional, uh, the traditional cookies, right? As three corners, right? And why is it three corners, right? It's uh, supposed to be uh, uh, Haman's pockets, because uh, uh, I don't know, he didn't have a square pocket, or some people like to say it's uh, uh, Haman's ears, uh, which indicates that maybe they thought he was a Vulcan, uh, or uh, that he, uh, it's a Haman's uh, hat, uh, because he lived in that old colonial Williamsburg, and they wore a tricorner hat. I don't know, but this is the tradition, to, and it's stuffed with, uh, in, in my childhood, stuffed with prunes or apricot or a poppy seed. Or today, it's very clever. You can stuff it with chocolate, anything you like. Okay, uh, they're much better than they are uh, than they were when I was a child. But nonetheless, the idea is to eat special food to celebrate the defeat of an enemy. Of the Jews. The Jews have had enemies. For 3,500 years, the Jews have had enemies. Passover is coming up. We're going to eat special Passover food to celebrate and commemorate the defeat uh, of over Pharaoh. We eat this special food uh, to remember the defeat over Haman. But again, let's bring it into the 21st century. The Jews still have enemies today. We have enemies. Uh, and we'll talk about momentarily, but throughout our history, the survival of the Jewish nation uh, has been threatened and continues to be threatened by a succession of petty tyrants. The only unique question is, what shall we eat to celebrate their defeat? For example, uh, Vladimir Putin, right? The epitome of evil today, at least if you listen to the media. Um, but nonetheless, no friend of the Jews. And right now he's turned his attention westward to Ukraine. But how easy would it be for him to turn his attention southward to Israel? When and if that happens, it will lead to his defeat. And at that point, we will celebrate the defeat of Vladimir Putin by enjoying Putin brittle. Putin butter and jelly, maybe. I don't know. These are just some ideas that I had. Jello Putin pops, mmm, right? Uh, Putin nickel bread, right? We have Putin nickel bagels out there. We can celebrate. Uh, Yorkshire Putin, that's a, that's a favorite. Putin de Gallo, and for those of us living in the world of Tex Mex, sure, why not? How about a Putin platter if you like Chinese, uh, Asian food? Putin platter, delicious. Putin on the Ritz, it's a child, children's favorite everywhere. <laughs> what about Iran? What about Iran? What about Israel's neighbor to the, uh, to the uh, northeast, the great Persian nation of Iran, led by Khomeini. 
Khomeini, Chaumeini would be great. If you tried to destroy the Jewish people, Mr. Khomeini, we will enjoy eating your Chaumeini. Or how about a Khomeini Kalachi? That's if you're coming south in Texas, you might want to do that. Or how about KFC, by which I mean Khomeini fried chicken. It's finger licking good, after all. Or what about uh, his friend Hassan Rouhani? How about Rouhani? What would we eat if Rouhani comes against the Jewish people? Rack of Rouhani. That's Rice of Rouhani. We have a side dish and we have a protein right there. Rocky Rouhani ice cream and a dessert for this guy. A whole meal for this guy. What about Hamas? Right? They remain the enemies of Israel, of the Jewish state. What will we eat to celebrate the defeat of Hamas? Hamas hummus, of course. What about Hezbollah? They're also the enemies of the nation of Israel. Uh, and uh, Hezbollah, very easy to remember. Uh, we will eat Hezbollah. It's a delicious breakfast cereal for all. A way to remember throughout the day the enemies of the Jewish people. What about, okay, here's a time of in memoriam. In memoriam. Those who have been defeated without accomplishing their goal of eradicating the Jewish people from the face of the earth. What will we eat in remembrance of these people? For example, ISIS. You remember ISIS? They were a flash in a pan, but we would eat ISIS, ISIS. They're delicious, so many different flavors, so many different styles. How about, may he rest in, in, well, let's, Let's just imagine ourselves playing a game of Mad Libs, right? And fill in your own, uh, your own word. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Al-Baghdadi doodles, delicious. Oh, you will remember the evil general, Qassam, Soleimani. What will we eat in remembrance of Soleimani? Salamani Salami, Salamani Suvlaki, Salamani Sukiyaki. All the world will be able to celebrate the remembrance in memoriam of this enemy of the Jews. But ultimately speaking, that's fun stuff, but Luke of Astor leaves us with a question. Can one person be God's instrument in determining a nation's destiny? Can one person be God's instrument in determining a nation's destiny? Just think it through for a second. It's not a trick question. The answer is yes, yes. If the person has the right God, if the person has the right faith, if the person has the right perspective, and if the person is willing to act on what it is they believe. Individuals can certainly have an effect on a nation, but God must superintend the process. God must orchestrate the events. God must influence hearts. And God must override decrees according to his will. If God is working behind the scenes, then and only then, an individual can make a difference. If God is not working behind the scenes, what can one person do? But the good news for us in the book of Esther, which does not mention the name of God, is that God very clearly is working behind the scenes. Uh, we talked about the Abrahamic covenant. We talked about the new covenant. These things are still operative today. As a book, as just unique, and that there's not a single reference to God, not even a prayer. You couldn't spare a little piece of the scroll for a prayer, not, not, not even a prayer directed to him. And so for me, the author is seemingly going deliberately out of his way to avoid mentioning God. It would be so easy to mention God, so easy to reference the Abrahamic covenant or the new covenant. But as just the main scriptural example, however, it demonstrates how God works through providence, behind the scenes. 
And throughout most of human history, God's chosen to work providentially without direct and obvious intervention. This is how God works most of the time. Not every moment in our lives comes out of a Cecil B. DeMille movie. Most of our lives, we never see God directly intervene. But day by day, we know his hand is at work, providentially, but without direct and obvious intervention. Esther reminds us. Esther's the book for the rest of us and the rest of our history of what to do when you don't have Moses or Jesus or Elijah or Elisha or waters parting, axes floating on the regular. So if God is at work, and he is right now, even now, can you let go of your anxiety? Can you let go of your fear? Can you let go of your stress? Can you let go of everything that is holding you back? of fully functioning as a child of God by laying your burdens at his feet, casting all your cares, laying all your anxieties before him, before the throne of grace, because he cares for you. We may not be living in the direct, dire, and dramatic circumstances described in the book of Esther, but nonetheless, we right now are living in times of significance. And all of us can be Esther's. All of us can be Mordechai's, waiting to act and make a statement on behalf of God. It wasn't because Mordechai was a Jew that he didn't bow down before Haman. Text us and tell us. I think it was because Mordechai was a Jew who wanted to make a statement before the government and was unafraid of suffering the consequences. So what statement are you willing to make? Why are you here for such a time as this? Is there significance for you, one person, can you be significant? Are you significant? Can you make a difference? The answer is absolutely yes. As long as you remain trusting in the God of Israel, in relationship with our Father through the Son, by means of the Spirit, walking step by step, decision by decision, moment by moment in faith and in confident boldness that God can and is using you right where you are. We can't all be queens, right? Well, say some can, but we can't all be queens, we can't all be, but we all can act as children of God, sons of the Most High. That makes us princes and princesses.